Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The writer of Hebrews began chapter 11 by explaining faith, what it is and what it does. We learned last week that faith is the belief that God exists. Not that a God exists, but that God, the God, exists. Interestingly enough, if you read the New Testament in the Greek, every time you see the, the word for God, uh, I can't even think of the, but every time you see the Greek word for God, the article the always appears before it. And that's not always, transla- that doesn't always make it into the English translation. But when you read the New Testament in Greek and it says God so loved the world, you read it in Greek, it says the God, the one true God, so loved the world. And it is that way every single time God is mentioned in the New Testament. So, Faith is the belief that God, the God, exists. And it's a trust, a belief that he rewards those that diligently seek him. And faith pleases him. And now that's last Sunday's sermon in a nutshell. And y'all probably would have appreciated it if I'd given you the nutshell version last week. But that's, that's what we've got. Faith is believing that God exists, that he rewards those that diligently seek him. And if you have that faith in your heart, then you'll please God. Amen. Hebrews eleven six. After the writer expresses what faith is and what it does, he begins listing examples of Bible heroes who showed great faith. Last week we looked at Abel and we looked at Enoch. This week we'll look at Noah. Noah's faith, was something else. Noah's faith made him stand out from the rest of his generation. He stood out from everybody else. Why? Because of his faith. Noah believed God and Noah obeyed God. Why did Noah obey God? Noah obeyed God because he had faith in God. Noah obeyed God because he trusted God. As a result, God took special notice of Noah. And we find Noah's story written in the Bible. You see, people try to get God's attention in a number of ways. They, they try to, I remember when I was in high school, there was this girl that I wanted to take to the homecoming dance. But she was a real religious girl. And I, I asked her to the homecoming dance, and she said she'd have to pray about it first. And that concept to me, I mean, I grew up in the church, but that concept to me was foreign. You pray about who you go to the homecoming dance with, really? Okay, so I started, I started doing a whole bunch of stuff to straighten up my act to get God's attention so that God would tell her to go to the homecoming dance with me. My plan didn't work. But you see, the problem was, was I was trying everything the wrong way. I decided I'd read my Bible once a day, and I would pray to God once a day, and I would start making the Wednesday night and the Sunday night services at church, not just the Sunday morning service. I would listen to the preacher and you know, maybe take notes, but you see, I didn't have faith, and God was protecting that poor girl, because I was the last person anybody should have been going out to the homecoming dance with in high school, and I'm not a big proponent of homecoming dances anyway these days, but anyway, this is a different day and age and a different Leland, so we're doing all right. It's not what you do that gets God's attention, it's your faith. Noah's faith got God's attention. In Matthew chapter 8, a Roman centurion approaches Jesus to plead for healing for his servant. And what impressed Jesus about that Roman centurion was not his position, was not the fact that this Gentile would even bother to talk to me. What, what got the attention of Christ in Matthew chapter 8 was this centurion's faith. The centurion says, I want you to heal my servant. And Jesus says, okay, let's go. And the centurion says, no, 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 no. Yeah, I'm not worthy that you should come into my house. I know you can just say the word. And the Bible says Jesus marveled. 
And he said, that I had not found so great a faith, no, not in all of Israel. What got Jesus' attention in Matthew chapter 8 with that Roman centurion was his faith. That's what gets God's attention. And then that results in the way you live. Noah's faith distinguished him from the rest of his generation. The rest of Noah's generation was living it up. They were having a good time. They were partying. They were doing business as usual. The Bible says, Jesus says in Matthew 24, 38, he said they were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. So they were eating. They, harvest time was good. They were enjoying good food. They were drinking. They were enjoying good drink. It was a very violent society, so it would follow that some of that drink was alcoholic. The, the, we just know that they were eating and drinking they were marrying, they were giving in marriage, or they were getting married, and they were giving their daughters and their sons to be married. It was business as usual. Life is good. Life is prosperous. And you know what? There's really nothing wrong with enjoying life. If you got your brisket sitting at the house, and you want to throw that on the barbecue and smoke that for a few hours and have you a good barbecue, by all means, dig in. 208531 call me and I'll help you partake of the of the fruit of your labor there nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with having a job with having a good job nothing wrong with with taking a vacation and taking time out to enjoy God's creation just never let that take the center point of your attention off of God what had happened in that pre-flood society as they were so busy with the day-to-day -day and business as usual God wasn't anywhere in their minds and as a result they began to become more evil the Bible says that they were wicked in Noah's day and age their marriages were based on physical desires in Genesis 6 2 it says the sons of God looked at the daughters of men how they were fair and they took unto them wives why were these sons of God marrying the daughters of men? Why were these godly men marrying ungodly women? Because they looked good. They were fair. They were beautiful. They were, they were supermodels. Well, I'm, okay, supermodels aren't really all that beautiful. But, I mean, they, they, they were very pleasing to the eyes. And so, and so they were marrying them. You had godly people marrying ungodly people because of physical desires. And that's disaster every single time. And it got to the point as they began to have children and, and the children began to have children and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren that the faith that had been preached and taught began to be diluted and was basically bred out. And you got to a point where society was wicked and the Bible says that every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. The Bible goes on to say in Genesis chapter 6 that violence filled the earth. Sounds kind of like today's society, doesn't it? Every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually. <clears throat> we have some very wicked things happening in this world. Not only in the Brownwood Police reports but you pick up a newspaper or you pull up the internet and read the news and something horrendous has happened and you wonder how could somebody do this the uh, Abilene police arrested a man this past week for running a meth lab with his two children in the home it, it, it's bad enough to run a meth lab but to do it in the presence of small children and then you have another group that says, well, if you'll just decriminalize it and make it legal, then you won't have the crime. Well, it, it doesn't solve the problem. It just solves the problem of the law enforcement end of it. We have a wicked society. Violence filled the earth in those days. But Genesis chapter 6, 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now, grace means unmerited favor, undeserved love. Noah was a sinner. He was a sinner. He was a man that had, he had, he had sinned, he had the sin nature, but don't make the mistake of thinking that Noah was just like everybody else and Noah was no different than anybody else. Noah was different from the rest of his generation. Genesis 6, 9 goes on to say that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. He was a just man. That word just means righteous. He was just, he was righteous. Righteousness comes from salvation. 
righteousness and salvation come from faith. He was righteous. God looked at him and saw him as being righteous. Why? Because Noah had faith in the Lord. The Bible also says he was perfect. That word perfect means complete. It means he was the real deal. See, Noah didn't go on Facebook and type up something about God. God bless you. God loves you. Praise God. And then go out to the liquor store and get hammered. At least not until chapter 9. But in his generation, in that day and age before the flood, he was the real deal. He professed God, and he followed God, and what he said came out of his heart. He was perfect. He was complete. He was a sinner, and we see that fault that he had. We see him stumble after the flood. We know he wasn't perfect in that he never sinned, but he was perfect in that he was the real deal. So he was just, he was perfect, and the Bible says he walked with God. Now, if you remember, we talked about this last week with Enoch, how he walked with God for 300 years. He took time to be with God. He spent time with God. He communed with God. He communed with God by praying to him. He communed with God by seeking God's will and God's word. How do I know that he did that? Because that's how you spend time with God. You see, other religions have temples. You go into the temple to spend time with God at at, at, at if you, are, if you believe in a false religion, you go to the false temple to spend time with a false god that's not even there, but people think he's there. But our God, the God, the one true God, is everywhere. And to spend time with him, you just need to stop and, and shut everything else down for a while and spend time with him. And the, way that I, the only ways I have been able to figure out how to do that is to stop, tune the world out, pray to him, read his word, and let his spirit impress upon my heart. Noah took time to walk with God. Why was Noah like this? Why was he a just man? Why was he a perfect man? Why did he walk with God? Because he had faith. Hebrews 11:7 says, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Noah was who he was because of his faith in the Lord, yes. because of his faith in God. Noah believed God. Noah trusted God. And so Noah spent time with God. And because Noah had that faith in God, he stood out before God. And just as Noah's faith made him stand out before God, your faith can make you stand out before God as well. The Bible says, Hebrews eleven six says that faith pleases him. Because without faith, it's impossible to please him. So if it's impossible to please God without faith, then it must be possible to please him with faith. The Bible teaches that God responds to faith. In James 5, 15, it says the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The prayer of faith, the prayer that knows God, that trusts God, that believes in God, that's the prayer that God responds to. God doesn't respond to the prayer that doesn't, is not sure that he's there. God, if you're up there. God doesn't respond to the prayer of ritual. Jesus said that the uh, heathens have their vain babblings and, and sayings and, they, they, and repetitions and they think that they shall be heard for their many words. It's not the vain babblings and repetitions that God responds to. It is the prayer of faith, the prayer that trusts, the prayer that believes and he responds to that. Noah's faith made him stand out before God. And Noah believed God. Noah trusted God. That was the kind of faith that stood out to him. Noah trusted God. He believed God. Hebrews 11.7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. He was warned of things not seen as yet. Do you know before the flood it had never rained on the earth? God had a sprinkler system. The, the Bible says that there was a mist that went forth from the earth. 
Now, my house has a sprinkler system. The city of Early won't let me use it. I, once I had a good yard, but then the drought hit and the city of Early says don't use that sprinkler system anymore. They didn't ban all sprinkler systems, just the ones that spray water in the road, and I haven't figured out how to fix mine yet. But when I turned that sprinkler on before they banned it, when I turned that sprinkler on, there was a mist. These little heads would come up from the blades of grass, and there was a mist that would go forth from the earth. God had a sprinkler system. That's how he watered the earth. That's how he watered the plants, and it came on every morning. So if you have a sprinkler system, you water your yard about 5 o'clock in the morning, you know, that's a good time to do that. The Bible says it went, it burst, it, 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 the mist came forth every morning. It had never rained before. But God warned Noah of a flood. A flood had never been seen before. If God warned Brownwood of a flood, we'd bl probably believe him because we've seen a few. But in Noah's time, they had never seen a flood before. But Noah believed God. God says there's a flood coming. Never seen it. Don't know what it looks like, but God says it's coming, so I'm going to respond to this. And I'm going to believe God. I'm going to make, I'm going to take the, the proper steps to prepare for the coming of this flood. Noah moved with fear. That word moved with fear, it means to move quickly. He moved with fear. He moved quickly to prepare the ark. It took him 120 years, he and his, he and his three sons. That was 120 years of hard work, of diligent work, of paying attention to detail, of, trying, of, of cutting the trees, making the, the, the planks and the panels and the boards and everything that had to go into that. 120 years he worked hard and diligently. Why? Because he believed God, even if he didn't understand what was coming. 120 years. How many of y'all would have given up after 60 you know, it's been 60 years. We haven't seen this flood that God said is coming. You know, one of the most dangerous things you can do, God has uh, warned us that the end is coming, the judgment's coming. Yes. And one of the worst things you can do is say, you know, they've been saying this for 2,000 years. Preachers have been saying the end is near and the Lord's coming back for 2,000 years. So it's probably not going to happen now. Peter wrote that in the last days there will be scoffers that would say, uh, "Where is the sign of his coming?" For, for you know, for the father, you know, from the time of the fathers, men have uh, fallen asleep and things continue as they were. It's, Jesus said, "Surely I come quickly." And he said those words two thousand years ago. Well, if he said it two thousand years ago, we must really be getting close. Well, he said it 2,000 years ago. Why did he say it's coming quickly and then wait 2,000 years? You've got to understand, time means nothing to God. Time is something only we're bound to. God's not bound to time. I thought about that last night because I'm thinking about all the stuff I want to get done before I turn 60. And God doesn't care if I get those things done before I turn 60 or if I get those things done after I turn 80 or if they're not in his will, he doesn't care if I get them done at all. Time is nothing to God. 2,000 years, the Bible says, a 1,000 years is as a day to the Lord. We have been warned of things by God, of things not seen as yet. We have been warned of the rapture. We have been warned that there is a time coming that Christ will descend with a shout of the, arch of the archangel, and he will, call, he will call his people to him, and we'll meet him in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. This is going to be an event that, human, that has never been seen in human history. Multitudes of people who know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior are going to be caught up in the air with Jesus. It's going to be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen quickly. And the people that are left behind are not going to know what happened. Some of them might piece it together. But the thing that we learn from the rapture, the thing that we learn from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you take those two passages together and then, and then put that in harmony with the book of Revelation, is when this event happens, it's final. 
There are no late arrivals. Yeah, there are no makeup flights. The Lord doesn't grant a 90-day extension. The time is coming. He has warned us. And if you're not prepared on that day and you get left behind, there's no recourse for you. We have been warned of things not seen as yet. Do you believe it's coming? And if you do believe it's coming, have you acted on that belief? We have been warned about the coming judgment. Hebrews 9.27 says, As it is appointed unto men once to die. We get that part. We see that all too often. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. None of us have seen the judgment. But God says the judgment's coming. So whether you get caught up in the air, well, Leland... Christians have been looking for the rapture for 2,000 years. Hasn't happened. Probably won't happen in my lifetime. Love, you may be right, but you still have a lifetime, and that time is going to come to an end. And you don't know when that time is going to come to an end. Are you prepared? You've been warned of things not seen as yet. We need to diligently prepare like Noah did. Noah diligently prepared. He worked hard. He, he paid attention to detail. The Bible says he did all that the Lord commanded him to do. We need to do all the Lord has commanded us to do. The Lord has commanded, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Lord has commanded that you repent and you believe. You repent of your sins and trust him as your personal Savior. Oh, Leland, I did that. I, I said a prayer back when I was a kid. I was 12 years old, and the preacher preached a series on hell and that scared me and there's a joke that goes along with that but I don't think I should repeat that from the pulpit but I went to the preacher and I didn't want to go to hell I didn't want to go to hell and so he told me to ask Jesus into my heart and so I did I said a little prayer Jesus please come into my heart clean me up make me whole you know there's there, there, there's a wording to it he led me through it the man was well intentioned he was just doing what what he knew to do to a 12 year old that came to him wanting to stay out of hell okay so I don't fault that man at all for this but what I did not do was there was no repentance there was no contrition on sin the Bible says in Isaiah 118 come let us reason together saith the Lord though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as snow there was no reasoning with God just come into my heart so I don't have to go to hell I wasn't even really that sold on heaven I'm just I just didn't want to go to hell I wasn't sold on where I wanted to go I just knew where I didn't want to go and my lifestyle throughout high school and college proved that I'd never accepted the Lord and I didn't have faith in him. I didn't have faith toward him. I just said a prayer. A lot of people are living under that prayer. A lot of people are living under a religious experience they went through, a religious ritual that they went through. The Bible says if you don't the Bible says you're saved by grace through faith apart from works. You are saved by God's grace by his unmerited love toward you by faith. That's your trust in him apart from any works by grace through faith for it is by grace that ye are saved through faith and that not of yourselves is the gift of God not of works lest any man should boast included in those works is that little prayer that asked Jesus into my heart that prayer that asked Jesus into your heart that's a work doesn't that saying that prayer doesn't disqualify you from salvation if you truly had the faith the faith needed to motivate the prayer and so you say I'm confused 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. When you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, were you sorry or repentant of your sin? And were you trusting his blood on the cross to get you into heaven? Were you trusting him to get you into heaven? Or you may, was it a turning point in your life? Or was it just another experience? ritual exercise you know there's the day you got your training wheels off and there was the birthday when you got your driver's license and then there's the day that you said your prayer to ask Jesus into your heart was it a rite of passage or was it a turning point in your life did it change you are you different now than you were before then give diligence give all diligence to make your calling and election sure make sure you're saved and you do that by going back to your time of your salvation and seeing whether you truly repented and believed or if it was a religious exercise. 
and I can't tell you whether you did or not, only you know what was going on in your heart. But give diligence to make your calling and election sure. The uh, Bible says in Hebrews 10, 23, to hold fast the profession of your faith. Keep going back to that moment of salvation. I hear stories, people say that when they were saved, it was like getting a bath on the inside as well as the outside. And that's, that's a good explanation of how it feels to be saved. I remember I had, a, I had a weight lifted off my shoulders. That's how I felt. I had this old thing on my shoulders that was tearing me up, and it was gone. Um, I remember how I felt when I was saved. I remember the heartbreak over how rotten of an individual I was. And just the amazement at the miracle that Jessica and I were still married after, have, after her having to live with me for those first two years. Why are you amening that? <laughs> but, but it was just, there, it, salvation is a life-changing event. Was your salvation experience a life-changing event? Go back to that. Diligently seek God's will in your life and believe God. Believe his warnings. And heed his warnings. When I was in college, it's no longer there. In the middle of Stephen F. Austin State University used to be this 14-story tower, round building, Garner Hall. I lived on the ninth floor. And we had some of the, I had some of the dumbest neighbors. They would burn popcorn in their microwave oven, and it would set off the fire alarms. And so you had to evacuate when the fire alarm. Imagine going down nine flights of stairs, and the elevator never worked after these things were over, so you'd have to walk back up nine flights of stairs after the fire department had given you the all clear. This happened once a week, once a month, very, very regularly. It was somebody was trying to bake a potato, and it didn't go well, and it set the fire alarm off. Sometimes somebody pulled the fire alarm as a prank. And, and you got to the point where you would hear the fire alarm, and must be another false alarm, and you would try to get away with staying in your room. Of course, the fireman would come knock on your door, and if he caught you in there, he'd write you a ticket. So I learned not to do that anymore. Well, we just got so used to not heeding, not following the alarms. What if there had been an actual fire? By the time I'd realize I was in trouble, I'm on the ninth floor. There's no, there's no rescue there. Heed the alarms. Heed the warnings. And with God, unlike Garner Hall at Stephen F. Austin, with God there are no false alarms. So Noah believed God. And because Noah believed God, Noah obeyed God. Noah obeyed God because of his faith. Genesis 7, 5 says, Noah did according unto all the Lord commanded him. This means Noah did everything God told him to do the way God told Noah to do it. He didn't just build an ark. God says there's a flood coming. I better build a boat. He didn't just build a boat. He built the ark. He built the ark to the specifications that God gave him, which really came in handy. Because God gave him instructions on how to build the ark, how to build the interior, and that really came in handy when it came to putting those animals on there. Can you imagine putting a lion in the same cage as a, as a lamb or not having any cages whatsoever? You've just got lambs and lions and giraffes. You know, and they're all just out there together. That would have been a mess. Or maybe I'm just being silly. But God gave Noah a very specific set of instructions on how to build that ark. And there's a man who's a member of one of our sister churches in Crock, and he studied these specifications out quite in depth. And he has a model of the ark and how it must have looked according to what he's read in the Bible. And he can take the top off of it and the side of it and show you what the inside would have looked like as best as he can understand scripture. Noah made that ark the way God told him to make it. And not only did he make the interior, but he made the exterior of it. If you look at the measurements of the ark, I believe it was something like uh, 50 cubits, no, 60 cubits wide, 300 cubits long. That means the ark was six times longer than it was wide. The length was six times the width. Anybody who works in the shipyard will tell you that that's the same ratio that is used on modern ships today. When you look on TV and the, the military channels doing their big documentary on the Nimitz class aircraft carriers, that aircraft carrier is six times longer than it is wide. Why? Where did that, where did that formula come from? It came from the Bible. God knew the ins and outs of sea travel 
and he gave those to Noah, and Noah followed them. Can you imagine the mess if Noah had built something that was too narrow or too wide or too short? It would have been a mess. He did according to all that God told him to do. He did it the way God told him to do it. And as a result, he and his family were saved from the flood. Our faith should motivate our obedience. We are saved by grace through faith apart from works. But oftentimes, we Baptists, we are so adamant that you're saved by grace apart from works that sometimes it comes across as we're preaching against works. And we shouldn't preach against works. We should preach salvation by grace through faith apart from works, but that faith should result in works. There are so many people that have taken them, you know, I, I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. But their lives, they have nothing to show for their faith. You're saved by faith apart from works, but refusing works, refusing to obey God will lead to destruction. So act on your faith. You know, if Noah hadn't have built that ark, or if he hadn't have built it the way God told him to build it, it would have been a messy situation. We might not be here today. But Noah was obedient. He had works. He had faith. The faith resulted in his works. And so therefore he was spared from the flood. Act on your faith. Have that faith in your heart and let that express itself in the way that you live. You don't have to look very far in Scripture to see somebody whose lives were destroyed by their disobedience to God or, or their disobedience to his law. Don't make the same mistakes. Those, those, those examples in Scripture are given to us as examples so we can learn what to do and what not to do. Noah was who he was. He was a hero of the faith because of his faith. His faith defined who he was. Does your faith define who you are? Does it motivate your actions? Does it, do, does it give you the character or the personality that you are? Or is your faith just something that gets mentioned on a Sunday morning? Let your faith be who you are. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us. Father, we thank you for the word that you've given us, your scriptures, Father, which strengthen us, which build our faith. Father, and we pray that we would have the wisdom and the grace to not only to have the faith, Father, but to express our faith in the way we live. Father, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I stand